Good morning, happy Friday. Let's do the pledge and our motto and let's get started on our story. Salute and pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. And we're gonna try to do our motto <clears throat> without looking at the poster today. Let's see how we do. Begin. We are students at Peter J. Shields. We believe in kindness. We are responsible. We are persistent. We are respectful. We are bucket fillers. We drop acts of kindness into everything we do. We are Peter J. Shields. So hopefully you did well with that because we're getting towards the end. Um, and I'll show you it again. So Monday, technically, it's a holiday, there's no school, but I will go ahead because I want to get this book finished, hopefully by next Friday, even though our school day ends on Thursday. So let's get started so we can get this going. Chapter 21. Goodbye, Violet. This gum, <clears throat> Mr. Wonka went on, is my latest and greatest, my most fascinating invention. It's chewing gum meal. It's, it's, it's a tiny little strip of gum lying there but it's a whole three course meal itself. Oh, what sort of nonsense is this? Said one of the fathers. My dear sir, cried Mr. Wonka. When I start selling this gum in the shops, it will change everything. It will be the end of all kitchens and all cooking. There will be no more marketing to do. No more buying of meat and groceries. There'll be no knives, no forks, no meal times, no plates, no washing up, no garbage, no mess. Just a little strip of Wonka's magic chewing gum. And that's all you'll ever need for breakfast, lunch, and supper. This piece of gum I have made just happens to be tomato soup, roast beef, and blueberry pie. But you can have anything you want. What do you mean it's tomato soup, roast beef, and blueberry pie? Asked Violet Beauregard. If you were to start chewing it, said Mr. Wonka, then that is exactly what you would get on the menu. It's absolutely amazing. You can actually feel the good food going down your throat into your tummy. And you can taste it perfectly. And it fills you up. It satisfies you. It's terrific. It's utterly impossible, said Baruch Assault. Just so long as it's gum, shouted Violet Beauregard. Just so long as it's a piece of gum and I can chew it, then it's for me. And quickly she took her own world record piece of gum out of her mouth again and stuck it behind her ear. Come on, Mr. Wonka, she said. Hand it over this magic gum of yours and we'll see if this thing works. Now, Violet, said Mrs. Beauregard, her mother, let's not do anything silly, Violet. I want the gum, Violet said obstinately. What's so silly? I'd rather you didn't take it, Mr. Wonka told her gently. You see, I haven't got it quite right yet. There are still one or two things. Oh, to heck with that, said Violet. And suddenly, before Mr. Wonka could stop her, she shot out her fat little hand and grabbed the stick of gum out of the little drawer and popped it into her mouth. All at and it, ugh, excuse me, at once her huge, well-trained jaws started chewing away on it like a pair of tongs. Don't, said Mr. Wonka. <gasps> Fabulous, shouted Violet. It's tomato soup. It's hot and it's creamy and it's delicious. I can feel it running down my throat. Stop, said Mr. Wonka. The gum isn't ready yet. It's not right. Of course it's right, said Violet. It's working beautifully. <gasps> oh my, what lovely, lovely, lovely soup it is. It's changing, shouted Violet, chewing and grinning both at the same time. Ooh, the second course is coming up. Ooh, it's roast beef. It's tender and juicy. Oh boy, what flavor. And a baked potato. That is marvelous too. It's got a crispy skin and it's filled with butter inside. But how interesting, Violet, said Mrs. Beauregard. <laughs> you are a clever girl. Keep chewing, kiddo, said Mr. Beauregard. Keep right on chewing, baby. This is a great day for the Beauregards. Our little girl is the first person in the world to have the chewing gum meal. Everybody was watching Violet Beauregard as she stood there chewing this extraordinary gum. Little Charlie Bucket was staring at her absolutely spellbound, watching the huge rubbery lips as they pressed and unpressed with the chewing. And Grandpa Joe stood behind him gaping at the girl. Mr. Wonka was wringing his hands and saying, no, 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 it isn't ready for eating. It isn't right. You mustn't do it. Oh, blueberry pie and cream, shouted Violet. Here it comes. Oh my, it's perfect. It's beautiful. It's it's exactly as though I'm swallowing it. It's as though I'm chewing and swallowing great big spoonfuls of the most marvelous blueberry pie in all the world. Good heavens, girl, shrieked Mrs. Beauregard suddenly, staring at Violet. What is happening to your nose? Oh, be quiet, mother, and let me finish, said Violet. But it's turning blue, screamed Mrs. Beauregard. Your nose, it's turning blue. 
Your mother's right, shouted Mr. Bogart. Your whole nose has now gone purple. What do you mean, said Violet, still chewing away. Your cheeks, screamed Mrs. Bogart. They're turning blue as well. Oh, so is your chin. Your, your whole face is turning blue. Spit that gum out at once, ordered Mr. Beauregard. Mercy, save us, yelled Mrs. Beauregard. The girl's going blue and purple all over. Even her hair is changing color. Violet, you're turning violet. Violet, what is happening to you? Mm, I told you I hadn't quite got it right yet, sighed Mr. Wonka, shaking his head sadly. I'll say you haven't, cried Mrs. Beauregard. Just look at our girl now. Everybody was staring at Violet. And what a terrible, peculiar sight she was. Her face and hands and legs and neck, in fact, skin all over her body as well as her great big mop of curly hair had turned a brilliant purplish blue, the color of blueberry juice. It always goes wrong when it comes to the dessert, cried Miss Side Mr. Wonka. It's the blueberry pie that does it. But I'll get it right one day, you see if I don't. Violet, screamed Mrs. Beauregard, you're swelling up. I feel sick, cried, said Violet. You're swelling up, screamed Mrs. Beauregard. Oh, I feel most peculiar, gasped Violet. Well, I'm not surprised, said Mr. Beauregard. Oh, good heavens, girl, screed, screeched Mrs. Beauregard. You're blowing up like a balloon. Like a blueberry, said Mr. Wonka. Call a doctor, shouted Mr. Beauregard. Prick her with a pen, said one of the other fathers. Save her, cried Mrs. Beauregard, wringing her hands. But there was no saving her now. Her body was swelling up and changing rate, at, changing shape at such a rate within a minute that it had turned into nothing less than an enormous round blue ball. A gigantic blueberry, in fact. And all that remained of Violet Beauregard herself was a tiny pair of legs and a tiny pair of arms sticking out of the great round fruit with a little head on top. Yeah, it always happens like that, sighed Mr. Wonka. I've tried it 20 times in the testing room on 20 Oompa Loompas, and every one of them has finished up like a blueberry. It's most annoying, I just can't understand it, he said. But I don't want a blueberry for a daughter, cried Mrs. Beauregard. Put her back to where she was this instant. Mr. Wonka clicked his fingers and ten Oompa appeared immediately aside. Roll Miss Beauregard into the boat, he said to them, and take her along to the juicing room at once. The juicing room, cried Mrs. Beauregard. What on earth are they going to do with her there? Well, squeeze her, of course, said Mr. Wonka. We've got to squeeze the juice out of her immediately. After that, we'll just have to see how she comes out. But don't worry, Mrs. Beauregard. We'll have her repaired if it's the last thing I do. I am sorry about that, I really am. Already the 10 Oompa Loompas were rolling the enormous blueberry across the floor of the inventing room toward the door that led to the Chocolate River where the boat was waiting. Mr. and Mrs. Beauregard hurried after them. The rest of the party, including Charlie Bucket and Grandpa Joe stood absolutely still watching them go. Listen, whispered Charlie. Listen, Grandpa, the Oompa Loompas in the boat outside are starting to sing. The voices of the 100 of them started singing together, came in loud and clear. Dear friends, we surely all agree there must be, there's almost nothing worse to see than some repulsive little bum who's always chewing, chewing gum. It's very near as bad as those who sit around and pick their nose. So please believe us when we say that chewing gum will never pay, that sticky habit's bound to send the chewer to a sticky end. Did ever any of you ever know a person called Ms. Bigelow? The dreadful woman saw no wrong in chewing, chewing all day long. She chewed while bathing in the tub. She chewed while dancing at her club. She chewed in church and on the bus. It really was quite ludicrous. And when she wouldn't, couldn't find her gum, she'd chew upon the linoleum or anything that happened near, a pair of boots, a postman's ear, or other people's underclothes, and once she chewed her boyfriend's nose. She went on chewing till at last, her chewing muscles grew so vast. <clears throat> From her face, her giant chin stuck out just like a violin. For years and years, she chewed away, consuming 50 packs a day, until one summer's eve, alas, a horrid business came to pass. Miss Bigelow went to bed, went late to bed. For half an hour, she laid in red, chewing and chewing all the while, like some great clockwork crocodile. At last she put her gum away upon a special little tray and settled back and went to sleep. She managed this by counting sheep. But now how strange, although she slept, those massive jaws of hers still kept on chewing, chewing all the night, even when there was nothing to bite. They were, you see, in such a groove. They positively had to move. And very grim it was to hear in pitch dark, darkness loud and clear. The sleeping woman's great big trap was opening and shutting, snap, snap, snap. 
faster and faster, chop, chop, chop. The noise went on, it wouldn't stop, until at last her jaws decide to pause and open extra wide. And with the most tremendous chew, they bit the lady's tongue in two. Thereafter, from the chewing gum, Miss Bigelow was always dumb. She spent her life shut up in some disgusting little sanatorium. And when this, and this is why we try so hard to save Miss Violet Beauregard from suffering an equal fate. She's still quite young, it's not too late. Provided she survives the cure, we hope she does. We can't be sure. Chapter 22, Along the Corridor. <sighs> well, 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 sighed Mr. Wonka. Two naughty little children gone. Three good little children left. I think we better get out of this room quickly before we lose, lose anyone else. But Mr. Wonka, said Charlie Bucket anxiously, will Violet ever be right again? Or will she always be a blueberry? Oh, they'll dejuice her in no time flat, declared Mr. Wonka. They'll roll her into the dejuicing machine and she'll come out just as thin as a whistle. But will she be blue all over, asked Charlie. And she'll be purple, cried Mr. Wonka, a fine rich purple from head to toe. But there you are, that's what comes from chewing disgusting gum all day long. If you think gum is so disgusting, said Mike TV, then why do you make it in your factory? Oh, I do wish you wouldn't mumble, said Mr. Wonka. I can't hear a word you're saying. Come on now, off we go. Hurry up, follow me. We're going to the corridors again. And so saying, Mr. Wonka scuttled across the far end of the inventing room and went through a small secret door hidden behind a lot of pipes and stoves. The three remaining children, Veruca Salt, Mike TV, and Charlie Bucket, together with the five remaining grown-ups, followed after him. Charlie Bucket saw that they were now back in one of those long pink corridors with many other pink corridors leading out of it. Mr. Wonka was rushing along in front, turning left and right and right and left, and Grandpa Joe's kept saying, keep a good hold of my hand, Charlie. It would be terrible if we got lost in here. Mr. Wonka was saying, no time for any more messing about. We've never get anywhere at that rate. We've been going. And so on he rushed down the endless pink corridors with his black top hat perched on the top of his head and his plum colored velvet coattails flying behind him like a flag in the wind. They passed another door, then another and another. There were doors every 20 paces or so along the corridor now, and they all had something written on them and strange clanking noises were coming from behind several of them and delicious smells came wafting through the keyholes and sometimes little jets of colored steam shot out from the cracks underneath. Grandpa Joe and Charlie were half running and half walking to keep up with Mr. Wonka, but they were able to read what it said on quite a few of the doors as they hurried by. One, edible marshmallow pillows said. Marshmallow pillows are terrific, said Mr. Wonka as he dashed by. They'll be the rage when I get them in the shops. No time at all though, no time to go in. Lickable wallpaper for nurseries, it said on the next door. Oh, lovely lickable wallpaper, cried Mr. Wonka rushing past. It has pictures of fruits on it, bananas, Apples, oranges, grapes, pineapples, strawberries, and snozberries. Snozberries, said Mike TV. Don't interrupt, said Mr. Wonka. The wallpaper has pictures of all the fruits printed on it, and when you lick the picture of a banana, it tastes like banana. When you lick the picture of a strawberry, it tastes like strawberry. And when you lick the snozberry, it tastes exactly like snozberry. But what does snozberry taste like? Oh, there you go mumbling again, said Mr. Wampa. Speak louder next time. On we go, hurry up. Hot ice creams for cold days, it said on another door. Extremely useful in the winter, said Mr. Wonka. Rushing on hot ice cream warms you up in no end in freezing weather. I also make hot ice cubes for putting in hot drinks. Hot ice cubes make hot drinks even hotter. Cows that give chocolate milk, it said on the next door. Ah, oh, my pretty little cows, said Mr. Wonka. How I love those cows. But why can't we see them, asked Veruca Salt. Why, don't we get to, why do we have to go rushing past all these lovely rooms? We shall stop in time, called out Mr. Wonka. Don't be so madly impatient. Fizzy lifting drinks, it said on the next door. Oh, those are fabulous, cried Mr. Wonka. They fill you with bubbles, and bubbles are full of a special kind of gas, and this gas is terrifically lifting, so it lifts you right off the ground like a balloon. And you just go up until your head hits the ceiling. And there you stay. But how do you come down again, asked little Charlie. Well, you burp, of course, said Mr. Wonka. You do a great big, long, rude burp, and up comes the gas, and down comes you. Don't, but don't drink it outdoors. There's no knowing how high you'll be carried up if you do. I gave some to an Oompa Loompa once out in the backyard and he went up and up and up and up and disappeared out of sight. Very sad, I never saw him again. Well, he should have burped, said Charlie. Well, of course he should have burped, said Mr. Wonka. I stood there shouting, burp, you silly, silly one, burp. He'll never come down again, but he didn't or couldn't or wouldn't. I don't know which, but maybe he was just too polite. He must be on a boom by now. On the next door, it said square candies that look round. Wait cried Mr. Wonka, skidding suddenly to a halt. I'm very proud of my scary square candies that look round. Let's take a peek. And that, kiddos, is where we'll end today. Have a great day. Thanks for tuning in. Happy Friday. Bye.